Welcome to Pros and Cons, a podcast by writers for writers, brought to you by Precipice Fiction. Precipice Fiction would like to acknowledge the people of the Eora and Dorag Nations as the original custodians and storytellers of the land this podcast was created on. Okay. You can cut that okay. Or we could leave it in. Welcome everyone to Pros and Cons, a podcast by emerging writers for emerging writers, because sometimes we all here feel like absolute pros, and sometimes fortunately or fortunately depending on your state of mind we feel like a con um and yeah here we are we're back again and we have a uh, kasi pseudo full house uh we have ali burnham here hello matan hey hey we got patty hello and uh back with us again we got james healy in the house Hello, how's it going? And Ellie Burnham back in the house. It's been a while for It Ellie has as well. been a while. I've been doing a lot of teaching recently, three weeks in a row, and then I went out to Broken Hill. So uh, very, very rude of me to not be around for the podcasts. Ugh. Ellie, are you hiding something in Broken Hill? Am I hiding something? Under, under Is there the a reason you something keep of value? frequenting? Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's semi-writing related. Um, so I, uh, through my work with Westwards, we run creative writing workshops uh, for young people out in Broken Hill. I've This is my third time out. Um, and essentially what we do is uh, the students submit the short stories they work on during the workshops. Mm. And now I have between now and the Easter school holidays to produce a publication. We're actually going to do a physical print anthology of all the short stories they've been working on for the past six months. So it's <laughs> nice really one. cool. Get that's, to come back out cool. with the book and sh- present them with the book. And uh, we're going to throw a big mm. launch party. They get to sit at tables and sign wow. copies of the books and all the big stakeholders from Broken Hill will be there and their community, friends and family. So I'm really looking forward to now we're at the culmination end, the the celebration end of all the hard work. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. That's a good reason. That's yeah. a good reason to go to Broken Hill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're forgiven for the podcast. Misses. For not being here. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, and I am a Phoenix, Phoenix Rig for all those that don't know. Um, yeah. And uh, before we get into our topic today, which today we're talking about breaking a story, how do you break a story? And better yet, I guess, how do you avoid breaking a story? Uh, But it's more fun to talk about the actual shattering of these plot lines by accident or not by accident. Um, It's more fun to take it from that angle. So that's how we're going to go. But before we do that, uh, we're going to talk about some things we've been reading, watching, enjoying, whatever. Um, Matan, we'll start with you. Um, So... I'm about to finish Save the Cat by Blake Snyder, mm. uh, which is subtitle. Is that a subtitle? Is the second title the subtitle? Mm. Anyway, it says uh, the last book on screenwriting that you'll ever need. Now, I'm not a screenwriter, so I didn't need one to begin with. But <laughs> uh, it's it's really... Oh, yeah, there we go. We got Matt. Hey, Ali, I Ellie's think it was a recommendation from you. Um. So it's really great, even as someone who is not a screenwriter, because he really goes into depth about story structure, story archetypes, uh, likable heroes. So I do take things with a grain of salt when he goes into things that feel very specific to movies, especially about movies pace, because movies are really fast compared to books. But anyway, I really recommend it. You know what? If you're never going to write in your life, I still think it's worth a read because it's cool, especially if you like movies, which I Yeah, I think there's there's some really cool takeaways, like even it's when it talks about opening and closing images and that being a reflection of each other, like even if it's not an image in a novel, you still want whatever kind of your opening of your character Mm. arc to reflect the closing of your character arc and make that Mm. as clear as possible on page one and your final page. Just really neat bookends like that. I think are lessons that translate really well from, yeah, screen to book. Hmm. Definitely. Very cool. Uh, Patty? Uh, Elden Ring. Oh, Elden <laughs> <Nice>. Ring! 
<laughs> like five percent of the audience. Does the, the, does the game that. have an end, Patty, or is it like a not sandbox? that I've discovered? <laughs> no, it, it it does have an end. It's just riding around looking for it. <laughs> yeah, it's huge, and I'm What's taking good? my time with it. And it also, mm. uh, it really it, actually this is very on point. Kind of broke the story for me at one point. I don't give any spoilers, whoa. but I did a thing I wasn't supposed to do. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do it. I don't feel it was telegraphed in the game, and it <laughs> kind of broke the current storyline I was in. You embark on different mm. narratives, and each one mm. will give you like a different set ending to the game. So if you want a certain ending, you've got to do a certain narrative. And I kind of locked myself out of this one ending, right? And I'm playing it for a story. I'm playing it to be immersed uh, in a narrative, uh, and it really upset me. Yeah. And I put the game down you know for like what? six months because I was just, I was mad at it. Ah, oh, devastating. Love that. You know what, Patty? I, I really want you to stream yourself playing and I'd love to watch. I would watch. Personal experience. I think you should. I, I, think you should. I, mean, kind of you, I, I think you should. It's, if you I'm want. really if it's feeling this personal, game, I don't. Leave it. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll pressure you later privately. There's other stuff I've been thinking about streaming for a while, but um, anyway, Elden Ring is absolutely incredible. I can't say enough about it. And it's got very unconventional storytelling. Uh, maybe I'll touch on it again in the topic today. And rating House of Leaves. And that's me. Elden Ring is the game I wish I wanted to play more because it is. I, I touched it for a little uh, bit and I was like, uh, whoa, I can just feel the commitment of this story. But dang, yeah. it is or the commitment of this game. Mm. I don't have that time. But dang, it is so beautiful and clearly mm. so well done. But it's just like, I don't have the time to jump into this right now. Mm. And But I, oh, I'm living in myself. Alternate, <laughs> mm. Mm. If I had an alternate reality stream or alternate reality parallel being that could do that for me, I would. That would happen. <laughs> There's always anyway. a time. <laughs> the separate that's self true. that's always writing and the separate self that's always gaming. And then mm. the separate self yes. that's doing the laundry. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> wouldn't that but be nice? I, yes, not but for I the one that's like always would all fight. We'll just fight each other. Like none of me would want to be the laundry me. Yeah, you, yeah. Know? you get all, the story. All where of they me would want to be the others. Yeah, yeah. it's good. Uh, oh god. Uh, uh, <laughs> James, quick, James. <laughs> what's uh? What are, what do you got going on? As well as uh, um, can you introduce so, your dog. Your dog. Oh yeah, friends? Doggo here is a. He's just. He's, Doggo in the background here. Um, I don't really have the backstory for Doggo. <laughs> He's just that he was here in the chair when I sat That's down. And I just didn't want to shift him. So you I mean he looks more comfortable? He does look dead, but I'm pretty sure he just had to. Um, for everyone just listening to the audio, this is not a real dog. Oh yeah, sorry. there are no <laughs> dead dogs. In there the is a uh, oh. a comfort dog in the chair beside me. Um, yeah, I just think he had a big night out, and I think he's just chilling out. Um, <laughs> He's the embodiment of how I feel right now. <laughs> I just have to <laughs> make words and speak. So <laughs> we're early Sunday morning in Australia, and I woke up and discovered there's no caffeine in the house. So oh, I'm in yeah. a similar Ooh, boat. True. Yeah. I, feel that. I feel that. That's tough. Um, what I've been reading, I guess, most prominently, I know that I mentioned in a previous podcast that I had listened to the audiobook of Memoirs of a Geisha up until the last couple of chapters. So. Uh, yeah friend of mine who listens to the podcast sent me the book so that I could finish it over to Christmas. That's so nice. Yeah, That's just, so fun. Pretty sweet. Um, terrible ending. <laughs> <laughs> oh Immediate God. regret. Really? Yeah, you should talk old. about that when we get into the main topic, actually, because that's... Yeah. Hey. Then I will, because it's one of the worst endings I've ever written. Hey. Ever. Wow, <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> So yeah, a heads up, spoilers for Memoirs of a Geisha, but also don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> or stop two and chapters these have been end. my memoirs. Goodbye. Yeah, I think... And I, then it was over. Just the last two chapters blow the whole story. So yeah, I would just stop. Ooh, like, but now, chapter now you made me want to read it, just so I can understand what's so wrong with it. To be honest, great story. It's just a, it's a bit of a deus ex machina, but a real slap in the face deus ex machina. Mm. At the end. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So yeah, I might save it for the for the topic. Yeah, it's a good call. Beautiful. Yeah, Deus Ex Machina, a good topic actually for what we're going to talk about. Mm. Um, yeah, we'll save that. Ali, jumping over to you. Um, yeah, one I've been saving for a while. I actually saw this in December, but apparently I haven't been on a podcast since then. Um, the Banshees of Inisherin. I got to go to a, an oh, advanced yeah. screening of that. So I was very excited. I got mm. to see it before a lot of the, well, at least Australia did. 
um, and absolutely adored it. So Martin McDonough is one of my favorite screenwriters, playwrights, and has been for a very long time. Um, and the world gets blessed with a Martin McDonough movie every five years or so. And this is the latest one, and it's um, currently getting all the accolades at the Golden Globes did, and did Oscar he... noms and stuff. Did he write um, In Bruges as well? He yeah. did. So this okay. is Martin McDonough of In Bruges, Seven Psychopaths, um, Three Billboards Outside of Epping, Missouri. Oh, yeah. That, that's I've heard the of that. Guy. Yeah. He definitely <laughs> likes to use the same few actors. Uh, yes. Again so and you, again, you'll right? be able to yeah. trace his use of actors, but also mm. more just his um, bleak, dark well. humor. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And just. Well, Ali, if you haven't seen that, you might really enjoy that. Which one, sorry? The Guard. Is that his brother, oh, not Martin himself? Oh, I think that's Martin's okay. brother did the guard, Oops, but yeah, obviously very similar yeah. tone. Hmm. I'm like 95% sure of that. So worth Googling if anyone yeah, wants yeah. to um, complain. Oh, I, thought, I thought that was the same guy. Okay. Um, but I look, he's a masterclass in pace and tension, uh, like in foreshadowing. What, what I loved about Betch, he's obviously going to talk without spoilers, but the movie starts and he tells you exactly what's going to happen. So it's not a case of you watch it trying to work out what's going to happen. You watch it and he's like, this is going to happen. Therefore, you are strapped in for two hours dreading the thing that is going to happen. It's such mm. good foreshadowing. The question becomes, well, how is that going to play out? Um, yeah. there, there is a donkey introduced very on in the movie. And like 10 minutes, 15 minutes in, I'm like, this donkey is way too cute for a Martin McDonough movie. Therefore, this donkey's <laughs> going to only have one ending. Mm. Uh, it's not long for this world, but the question doesn't become oh, what or oh, well, what will happen. It's like how exactly and when is this going to happen to the doggy? And it's mm -hmm. such a good tension tool. It's just this string that gets drawn all the way back. Um, so I I love it structurally for that. He's a masterclass in that kind of foreshadowing. If you want to go check it out. Ali, that sounds painful. Just waiting for an adorable donkey to get whacked. Like, <laughs> I don't know if I can do painful. that. Uh, uh, but it's been so long since watch. I've sat in a movie theater just gripping the arm wrist rest where I'm just like, let it be over, let it be over, do it. Like, it's just, I'm just so engaged <laughs> just it, with every <laughs> emotional beat of that. Like every scene, you're like, is this the scene? How is this scene going to unfold? And it's it's such a simple story. It's one location. Obviously, he comes from a playwriting background, so it's... I, I, I love how it just strips away everything else, all the bells and whistles we've come to expect with movies. And it's just like, here's a handful of characters with a handful of problems. And, what, and it's what's just, it called? Uh, the Banshees the, of Inisherin. Yeah. Go check a really it. good name. Yeah, he makes a yeah. joke that he um he just likes eye sounds. So that's why it's called that. That that's like a meta joke in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I you said I sounds and I took it as like visual audio and I was like whoa that's a very like <laughs> what what is it, kinesthetic idea that's amazing I'm into that <laughs> the whole movie's a great um, eye well, sound I, so I do recommend I, it I it's also very beautiful <laughs> uh well I've just learned something about myself um something new about me that's cool I love eye sounds that's <laughs> now a new thing for me uh for myself I've still been reading Harry Potter and Frankenstein and like yeah or Harry Potter in Spanish and then Frankenstein in English um I'm loving them both I have not been doing a lot of reading like outside of editing other people's work like I it's funny because it's like I feel like I don't do any reading but in reality I read a lot like I'm reading constantly almost it's just I'm reading other people's work I've downed so many novels in this last year, but they're just not published novels. So I'm just reading from a different angle. Uh, and then I find it's hard to find time to read like, but I need to, I want to read other work as well. This might, this might like go over everybody's head. Does anybody, is there anybody familiar with nine gag, the meme app nine gag? You know how there's no. you just hurled you me can back rose... into my 15 year old self, Matan. No, 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 no. I'm so just rude. saying, cause nine, <laughs> Nine gig has like hot memes, which are the popular memes, trending memes, which are the on the way to become. And there's fresh, which is a hellhole of bad memes. You're basically mm. browsing fresh as an editor because you're reading the unpublished <laughs> stuff. You're browsing the fresh of literature and you're helping it's... the good stuff get to trending. 
that's it it's that's... it's true and there have been there has been some good ones and it's always amazing when it's great when a good one comes in because then i am like getting paid to just read a book i'm like oh this is just a good book this is very well done um and there's some that are not as they're a bit more rough and and that's a bit more like oh i'm slogging through but it's it's all good i love it but uh, aside from reading my partner and i literally just today finished avatar the last airbender it was my like fourth watch nice. it was my partner's first watch Ooh, very technically good. technically her second but she miraculously like in a, to an extent i've never experienced completely forgot completely <laughs> forgot what happened i would bring up some lucky girl. massive it was, I mean, it was great rewatching it, but like, uh, I would bring up some big details, like massive parts of the plot. And she just, I, and almost at, near the end, it was a joke. I'd bring it up knowing she wouldn't remember at all. And she'd be like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, wow. It was really fun rewatching the, it though. Uh, just a fantastic show. And on that note, we're going to dive in. So breaking a story what what do, what do we mean by breaking a story? I'll I'll paint a picture for you. Okay, so we'll we focus in on two characters. Let's call them Frodo and Sam. And let's say these two characters are walking through um, some desolate wasteland of a place. They haven't had water for so long. They haven't had food. Their lips are cracked. They're they're on this journey with a single focal point, a single vision, keeping them going. And then they're they're they've fallen down and they're like, how do we I don't think I could go on anymore, Sam. Let's say Frodo says that. And then um, Sam says, don't worry, and pulls out a magic wand and casts at a little rock on the ground and converts it into a beautiful shimmering cup of water and hands it to Frodo and says, drink up, uh, Frodo. I'm a wizard and we can make as much water as we want. Um <laughs> That's oh, the sound of glass described, shattering. You just described the fanfic, basically. Yeah, and that's that's something we could touch on today too. I actually have fan fiction in here. Um, but yeah, there's a lot we could talk about. <laughs> but the point being here, why why can't as authors we can there's nothing stopping us from writing physically any words we want on the page, and yet for some reason we can't do certain things because it would completely destroy the story for whatever reason. But there's nothing stopping any character from having magical, super fantastic powers or being able to do anything other than does it mean anything or does it suddenly make everything meaningless? And so it's a it's a matter of building significance with your reader and continuing that through in a way that's satisfying versus pulling something out randomly in a way that doesn't mean anything and potentially makes the rest of the story feel cheap. And that's what I, that's, that's where, that's the foundation for this discussion. How do you break a story? And what does that look like? How do you then avoid breaking a story? So one thing I would like everyone to start thinking about now, and we'll come to it later, because potentially it might need some thought. Can you think of a story uh, or some example in some way where you were just absolutely pulled out of the plot and were suddenly aware of the book in your hands or aware of the TV in front of you, you were suddenly thrust out of the narrative and were just like, what? I don't know. <laughs> um, so that's some homework to have in the back of your mind as we continue forward. I, uh, I actually have two examples already. <laughs> um, one of them happens really at the end. Now, I apologize if I can't remember the name of the movie, but I think it's a Robert Pattinson movie called Remember Me. Am I? Does anyone, that ring mm -hmm. anything to anyone? Uh, basically, mm -hmm. you're watching a rom-com and the last five minutes, you realize that the main guy is standing on one of the Twin Towers on the day of 9-11. And it just comes oh. out of nowhere. And you're oh, like, whoa. oh, wait, this is a 9-11 movie? I, I didn't realize <laughs> And it's just, it's so hmm. dramatic. It's so out of the blue. It just completely immersion breaking. Um, hmm. One I remember a bit more clearly is uh, Cloverfield Lane uh, 10, um, which is, a, honestly, I enjoyed the movie. It's the mo it's a movie about a girl 
that he's taken into a bunker by a guy and the guy insists that she can't go out because the air is poison and he basically locks her down in the bunker with him and another guy he gets violent kills the other guy anyway the whole movie you feel like you're watching this movie about this psychopath who's lying to this poor girl just for whatever he hopes to do to her and then towards the end of the movie uh, spoiler alert she walks out and after killing the guy by the way and an alien ship comes out of nowhere and tries to kill her. A ship full uh-huh. of aliens. <laughs> and it turns out that the guy was right. It isn't safe outside. It's not for the reasons that we thought. So it wasn't and ever the poison was... air. It was aliens that weren't mentioned. Yeah, aliens with uh, hmm. tentacles. Hmm. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. Good movie, really. Good movie, but uh, definitely okay. Okay. plot-breaking. And that... That's that's part of uh, the conversation as well is because obviously things come in because it can be used as a tool as well. You can pull randomness out mm-hmm. or coincidence out or subversion out, but it's when does it become story breaking and when does it add to the story at the end of uh, Game of Thrones season one and they cut off Ned Stark's head. Whoa. Sorry if you haven't seen that yet, but <laughs> at this point, it's uh, at this point, it's on you. Um, so. Why is that? Why does that make us angry because of the world and not angry because of the writers? Because it's like that makes no sense. Like, what are they doing? Why is that subversion done well? Well, and yeah, so did you want to finish Go that petty. thought before I okay? Yeah, the... In Game of Thrones, you can be surprised in the moment that Ned Stark's head was cut off, but then given time to think about it, maybe as you're lying asleep at night, well not asleep staring at the ceiling thinking about the episode you're like oh yeah of course he had his head cut off actually Mm. if i really think about that everything was pointing towards it there were all these warnings that ned was in out of his depth he was too good a person for this situation he knew what the capital Mm. was so shocking in the moment yeah but ultimately the text justifies it it built Mm. up whereas in matan's aliens example it sounds like (laughs) there there was no i mean a book i think a lot of the time is like a puzzle almost or like a a thread that you can follow and work it out and you can like everything makes sense like there's a logical progression even if it's not evident in the moment but if something just comes out of left field it almost feels like the author is is cheating or breaking the contract Mm. that's not that's not satisfying that's just a bunch of stuff happening is a good example for that um because i think a lot of those early big surprise twists are based on the book which spends like george spends a lot of time opening those brackets in that by the time the big surprise happens, you you look back on it and you're like, this was inevitable, like mm. surprising, but inevitable. This was the only way this could have unfolded because of all just the dominoes that were lined up and knocked over. Um, but mm-hmm. then when you get to the later seasons um, written by the showrunners, one of the biggest complaints that came out of the big Daenerys uh, kind of her character arc at That's the end it. is people. Yeah, people like the dominoes weren't set up properly. This was mm-hmm. surprising and shocking, which is what Game of Thrones was known for. But why does it feel mm-hmm. different? And it was it didn't feel inevitable in the same way all the other yep. big twists felt inevitable. It came out of nowhere. You it just mean didn't have the same groundwork laid. Her suddenly mm-hmm. becoming like an insane tyrant? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, Spoilers that's what I'm Thrones? alluding to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, not set I up well enough. I don't doubt the books will do it very well. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the show didn't take the time to do it. Uh, yeah. It just went straight from X. Well, no, X is too far in for this a metaphor. G to Z. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna feel fat, bad for all the people that named their kids uh, Khaleesi and then <laughs> saw that last episode. That's yeah. gonna be a kick in the teeth. <laughs> um, I think that's a lot of what um goes wrong at the end of Stephen King novels as well. I think that he breaks. He, he breaks his immersion a little bit by having endings feel like they've come slightly out of nowhere. Um, space turtles. Space turtles. Um, yeah, just like random characters or stuff come up kind of at the end and they end up being like the big bad and stuff like this that doesn't feel well set up. Um, one of my all-time favorite Stephen King novels is um, Under the Dome, which is a quite a bizarre little premise of just this small town, small American town, that finds itself one day encapsulated in a capsule, basically, where it just a dome just comes down on top of the the town, and the town is now cut off from the rest of America, and almost the entire story is based on the consequences and uh, the social dynamics within the town uh, that um, happened from this, kind of primarily based on 
um, an out of towner who ends up becoming kind of like the uh, the character who is blamed for all of the things that are going wrong. And this one character mm. within the town who sort of becomes a bit of a tyrant. Um, and it's really interesting social dynamics about how the tyrant sort of orchestrates a little bit of chaos and then uses that chaos to uh, seize more power in the way that you see we kind of hear about it in kind of society where it's like oh no the enemies are attacking we need to build up our home defense and stuff like this so it follows along that really sensible kind of line of social politics and stuff like this and you can follow the ins and outs of the characters all the way through and then right at the end it becomes revealed that the uh the dome <clears throat> the reason that it's there and i'm sorry spoilers um it involves like extraterrestrials and stuff like this. And it's a totally out of left field and um, just different element that's introduced into the story. And it just feels like, oh, I was really invested in what everything you'd done up until now. Mm. Now I don't know where to put my focus. And now this has become mm. the aspect mm. of the story that's going to cause the resolution. It makes me think of a dramaturgy tool. Um, it, it's more in the world of plays, but it, it's this idea that we talk about the world quotation marks, but it's a bit of a, a thought experiment that you literally think of your story as a world. So like a, a, a blank sphere and literally the only things that can exist on the blank sphere are the things you fill it with as the writer. So you, you mm. name a single street, therefore your sphere is only a single street and still you, until you start building your world out. And it's just this great little way to visualise the, the world you're creating nothing exists outside it unless it's mentioned in the text and i and mm. i think that's fine and it's really cute it's a it's a great way to think about story but i think when your solution to your plot suddenly comes from a place that hasn't been built on your sphere which sounds like exactly what you're describing james then it's lit that's what we mean by out of nowhere just trying to give it that mm. out of nowhere phrase a bit more um, a, a concrete meaning is you've been building your sphere and then suddenly if your plot takes a turn especially if it's a solution to your plot towards the end that hasn't been built on your sphere that is a very literal way to throw your characters out of the world and mm. the reader out of the world feels like it mm. also cheapens everything that came before it to a point and part of the reasons why we get invested in the stories is because we were expecting all these threads that we've invested time and energy and emotional energy into to have a payoff if it suddenly goes to left field you're like thinking like but then why did i read all of these these story threads like mm. what's the point yeah <clears throat> i'm thinking wheel of time <laughs> Which, <laughs> why read did we spend all this the time? guy no. died give him a break he you know he did and that's really sad but I mean, could he have wrapped it all up? And for anyone who hasn't read the series, it's a series that's kind of infamous now for incredible in the first three books. And there's like, what, 12 books or something? Mm. Is that right? Mm. Um, he introduces... Yeah, there's a lot of books. So many threads and so many characters and so many different directions that every time a new one comes up, it's like, oh no, please go back to the original story. Please, please, please. We just want to know what happens mm. with these people. Then um, mm -hmm. he died. It's George Martin... Our generation is Robert Jordan. Well, he hasn't gone that far, but I think he has similar symptoms. <laughs> yeah. In that the, the same complaints of the later books, uh, because uh, book four and book five aren't one after the other. They are simultaneous. Simultaneous. But instead of characters yeah. and this set of characters. And after a while, you're just like, wow, this story is going wide instead of going forward. Mm -hmm. And I think an audience mm -hmm. finds that a little bit frustrating. And so the, a lot of everyone's touching on very similar things is it's introducing stuff to your readers early on of significance that you want the reader's attention to be on so that you can tell a story about those things. And it, that's kind of your contract with the reader. That's your agreement with the reader. And when things come out of nowhere, it's unsatisfying. And some people might think I'm one of these people when I first started thinking about this is like, well, why as an author do I have to, I don't like, it's like when I think of contract, I think, well, well that's limiting. Why that's our, limiting my artistic creativity. But in the end, it comes down to, is it an interesting story or not? Yeah, you can put anything down. You could do anything you want. You're right. As an author, you can do anything you want, but is it an interesting story? And one way to think about it, kind of a story simplification that I like to think about is if you came home one day and you walk into their house and you're like, mom, you'll never guess what happened to me today. I have to tell you what happened to me today. 
and you launch into a story to try to convey or communicate some sort of significance uh, to an event that took place because let's say at the beginning you have to set up some context in order for the ending the actual event that took place to have meaning for your mom as it did for you you have to give her focal points to focus on it's important for you to know this person was there it's important to you for you to know what this person meant to me it's important for you to know what this person did 10 years ago because today <laughs> A blue car came out of nowhere. It's like, what? You haven't even been talking about a blue car. You've been trying to get me to understand this person. Now I don't understand the significance of this thing you've tried to communicate to me. And yeah, you're right. You, There's nothing saying you can't tell that story that you just told to your mom, but your mom's going to not understand the significance of the event in the end. And is that satisfying for you as an author to have your readers not understand what you were trying to communicate? And for me, no, it's not. I'm trying to communicate something that I think is cool. I'm trying to get the reader to be like, isn't this awesome? This is how it played out in my mind. And I'm trying to get you to understand that because like, look at this world, look at these characters, look at this event. Isn't that awesome? And if all of them are like, I don't get what you meant with that one giant tree that was, did, did that thing at the end, then it's like, ah, oh, dang it. Like, it's kind of a waste of energy on a few different parts. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that's just... that you say that because I, I love the the artistic instinct of um, I don't want to use tropes. I'm I'm not going to use structure. I, it's just going to come out of me and I'm going to celebrate how it comes out of me fully formed. And uh, I mm -hmm. think to a degree that that's cool and worth celebrating. But also, I, I think you need to set that up as then the promise of the work that you're delivering. So you, in the same way mm -hmm. we're talking about bookending a promise at the start and delivering at the end, if then your promise is going to be, I am defying I am defying structural tropes. This is going to be a crazy ride. That's a promise you make at the start. And then the audience mm. is set up, the trust is built, and they will go on that crazy ride with you. Um, yeah. Maybe not the best example, but I am thinking of um, everything, everywhere, all at once. Um, the, the promise very early on is you don't know what you're going to get from this. And then as an audience, you're like, great, I don't know what I'm going to get from this. And, and that's, that's the contract you're talking about. So rather than, mm -hmm. yeah, rather than thinking of contracts as restrictive, just whatever the promise you make with mm -hmm. the audience page one, and then now you've got your blank check. Now they they will mm -hmm. go on that ride with you. If you've held their hand enough, just at the start and you're good to go. Even that though circles back into a very satisfying conventional kind of story. All the craziness mm. happens in the middle, but by the end you're like, oh, we're back where we started and I could have predicted this. So even then it's following that that kind of convention. Yeah. I, an example of one that I feel that breaks that, that makes me really mad and it might, this might make some people mad. Matan, you might know it. Um, Slow regard for silent things. It's oh, uh, yes. Patrick Rothfuss's uh, little novella. Um, and I think where it comes from is because it's centered on a place who her character defies normal conven social conventions and laws. So she's an oddball character. So I can follow his logic in that he's like, because it's an oddball character, I'm going to write an oddball structure. And these two things are going to thematically represent themselves. And I'm like, th uh, intellectually, I'm there with you, Patrick Rothfuss. However, as a result, he's written the most boring piece of like several thousand words anyone could ever be subjected to. And it's really painful <laughs> to, to get through this story because there's no structure. And... But you know, I'm so <laughs> sorry. I'm just, I'm so starved for anything, you know, <laughs> Rothfuss. I would, I would read his, like his shopping list, you know, Rothfuss, <laughs> if you're listening, if well, you publish he's published your shopping one of list, those for you, so you can. $9, <laughs> I will purchase the damn thing. I will purchase the audiobook. I will watch the Netflix adaptation. Just, just give me something. So someone had to save the, the Rothfuss bashing. So that, that was a good shout out, Matan. But I, I think for me, the promise that's been broken is because the structure was so different to the world he's already established in his other two books that he's like, this novella is a part of this world. And I'm like, woo, more of the same feels like the promise being made. And then I, you read it and you're like this like I'll never get those hours of my life back is kind of my mm -hmm. my knee-jerk reaction to that story mm -hmm. so something fundamentally was broken there for me it's a condemnation <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it <laughs> James I'm still curious to know uh I mean why Memoirs of a Geisha hit a brick wall at a high speed at the end of the yeah, book yeah Memoirs of a Geisha and it's not 
it's not entirely that it wasn't uh, it wasn't entirely that it wasn't set up in the story but it definitely felt um I'll just give spoilers. So, so if you're reading Members of a Geisha or intending to read Members of a Geisha, maybe tune out for the next two or three minutes. Um, Wait. Uh, okay. I'm just going to shut down my... Just mute. Yeah. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the character me away. essentially is, is the story of a young girl who becomes... A, I believe she becomes orphaned. She essentially gets uh, sold into being a geisha it's kind of like this it's not quite the sex trade but it's very adjacent to it she's essentially a slave she's no control over her life and um, she comes to a point towards the end where she's about to be married off to a companion a friend who she's known quite well uh, they've survived world war ii and all this so they've she's not in a great place she's not very happy about it um she's all had this um infatuation with a another gentleman, a powerful gentleman kind of for the whole storyline. And the story is so, so well set up right at the ending to be a massive tragedy where she is within grasp of the life she wants and every all of the other characters are set up with their wants and desires and they're just on the cusp of getting these things and then this character makes some rash moves to try to get the life that she really wants because she doesn't want the life that she's about to have. And everything is set up perfectly for it to just come crashing down and be a massive tragedy be really bleak and really depressing which is what i obviously love in a story and Honestly. then at the end this attractive wealthy benefactor who she's been infatuated with just approaches her and is like oh yeah no i've actually been in love with you the whole time because you're so so beautiful you can come and be my side chick um, so the, the ending is basically like it's fine you're incredibly hot so don't worry about it and I was like oh okay chick it's kind book. of like even more depressing an ending than what I thought it was, it was gonna be I think in the bad way like, oh, yeah it's fine it, wow. it was fine the whole time because you were so beautiful you could have just yeah you could have just had it at the beginning there was no need for any of the story because you're beautiful so I was like okay bit of a deus ex machina bit of a Everything's fine if you're incredibly, wow. if, if you are so beautiful that you inspire art, you'll be fine. Um, but everyone else is fine, so don't worry about it. So I was like, oh, okay, it's a bit of a, wow. a, bit of a shit ending, in my opinion. It was written by a man. I was like, okay, makes sense. <laughs> you, you do say, though, that the guy, at least he's mentioned in the story, it's not like he's a completely oh, he he, character. He doesn't appear out of nowhere, but they yeah. didn't really have, I guess there was no... It wasn't it wasn't expressed that they had a relationship, it wasn't yeah. expressed that he was interested in her. He kind of expresses like, Oh, I always pretended not to be interested in you for this reason. But the story also sets up that he right at the end, it sets up that he is interested in someone else. So I was like, it's gonna be so good if it turns out that he's just into her mate because her mate has a different personality and it's just going to be like, he's just going to go that way and she's going to go this way and her life's going to be ruined. And I was like, this is going to be such a good tragedy. Are you just, are you just unhappy because she found happiness? Yeah. Did I you, did you long it. for a more <laughs> tragic I hate ending? it when, they, when it works out okay for the characters. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. I mean, she, she won. Okay. She got the W. Maybe it wasn't well earned, but let's be happy for her. You know? <laughs> Yeah, uh, we can be happy. It's not yeah, easy. We can do that. I, I do. Let her have her. her sad ending. Let her have her uh, <laughs> side chick uh, status with this reasonably sounding guy. Really. Sounds like a really fine book. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I guess. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for spoiling me. I don't think I'm going to read that. Uh... Yeah, I mean, it's it's a fairly... Uh, if, if you were going to read it, I'd read it until two chapters before the end and then just stop and then be like oh, just bookmark me terrible. give it to me with a bookmark <laughs> and i'll stop where you where you put it now yeah. if if there were hints maybe even subtle ones that he was interested in her and it turns out the reason he was interested in her was actually for some virtue that she's showing throughout the book especially a virtue that she has even though it's it's causing suffering to her you don't know, like a burdensome virtue do you think that would have changed? I mean, it's hard to know because you haven't read that book. But if that was the case, do you think that would have redeemed the book? I 100% feel like if it was something she was in control of or something that she had actively done that had mm. gotten attention, mm. it would have 
felt different. But at the end of the day, because it wasn't true her actions that he came to her and told her this. It, at the end of the day, someone comes in from outside mm. and gives her everything she needs rather than it being as a result of her actions. Um, I felt like her, the story set up her actions that they were going to work against her, basically. Um, she kind of plots and she puts some stuff together. And that was kind of what the character was doing. She was a social character. She was moving. She was active within the story and she was being dynamic. And it should have been as the result of her dynamic behavior that it mm. worked out the other way. Um, so it, it should have been, it has to be something that the character has done. I don't feel like you can have just some character drop in from out of nowhere and be like, oh, hi, I'm your wealthy aunt. Here's <laughs> here's the solution to all your problems um, and fix things. I feel like that's always going to be an unsatisfying ending. It's always going to feel like a written ending. It's just going to feel like, oh, we're at the end of the story now and we have to sum things up. Um, oh, by the way, there's treasure buried underneath your floorboard <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> Um, that's basically what it felt like because you know you you have a character walk in and be like by the way did you know how beautiful you are here's all of the money <laughs> I love it we, I just love it we talk about that a little bit especially in the lead up to publishing our anthology the new mythic available now on Amazon um, the idea <laughs> of having a character that's active versus passive so it's I don't want to say always, but it's probably good practice to have a character that is there making influence on the world and things, especially a protagonist, things in the world are happening because of their action, as opposed to a character who the world is just happening to them. Mm. They're not they're not the active instigator of things in the story. I feel like there's a that's yeah. connected to what you're saying. I, I'm right in the 100%. middle of a writer's room at the moment, and a phrase we keep tossing around is, have they earned their protagonist status? So we're, yeah, we're right in the middle of creating mm. these characters from nothing, and we, we have a few options on where it can go. And so, like, the story's just coming to life in front of us, and every time we get them to choose to do something, we're like, everyone in the room can sense that's the stronger choice. And we're like, great. With, with each choice they make, they're earning their protagonist status. This is why we've put mm. this person in the center of this story engine. And it's just trying to get them to be as active as possible in their own creation, which is kind of cool. Um, sorry if this is a bit of a tangent, but I was trying to ask my brain if there's any other examples of ways stories get broken. You, you may have been circling uh, yeah. to this, Phoenix, but this idea that working in fantasy a lot um, and genre, uh. and I think even crime might run into this a little bit, but there's sometimes where as authors we need to insert uh, weird little hints about the law. Sometimes we need to put in clues that may seem out of place at the time, but it's a matter of don't worry, it comes back later and it's going to be relevant. Yeah. And I know with a few of my beta reads, when I've tried to do this, they'll notice a sentence or things I've just put in at the top. Um, and they're like, this feels out of place. You, you've thrown the, I've been thrown out of either the pacing out, out of the world and it's me as author, I have to be like, well, I need that in there because that's mm. a key detail for later. But how can I mm. either massage it in so it's either natural to the point where they don't see it or actually, no, it's really important they see it and it's actually important that they found that it's a bit weird. I need them to notice that it's odd because it's going to come back later and a, a phrase to steal from Brandon Sanderson he calls it hanging a lantern on it so if there's something that seems out of place and the reader thinks it's a mistake as an author if you go in and make a bigger song and dance about it if you literally hang a lantern on this odd thing again it's it's just creating the trust that then the reader instead of thinking they've read something that's a mistake or bad writing they go oh that's intentionally odd that's intentionally out of place i now mm -hmm. feel smarter for having noticed it so that would be the characters like remarking on like but that doesn't make any sense why is that a thing just yeah. so mm -hmm. that's the a like yeah, yeah okay you're your instincts as a reader, you're not wrong. The characters know as well. Just Yeah. So as a reader, mm -hmm. rather than being like, that was odd, but no one, yeah, as you said, no one else has reacted to it. So it feels like as a reader, you've had an incongruent mm. um, emotion. So you feel out of place. Mm -hmm. You just go, no, that was the right emotion. You just kind of reassure the reader. Yeah, that was, you're on the right path by mm. that feeling weird and out of place. Something that I'm 
thinking of is very prominent. Uh, I'm wondering if it's the same thing you're talking about. In the opening few chapters of um, uh, George Martin's Game of Thrones, he mm. has the phrase... And not like it's it's used like the others take them or the others damn them or something like that. The characters use it in the way that you might say, like, oh, the devil take them or the devil damn them, something like that. So that phrase like others like, take oh. you, yeah, something like that. Yeah, but then is then, it like to hell with it? Yeah, it's basically to hell with it. Basically, you're kind of like screwed, yeah. but it's used that way, um, which feels really out of place the first time you come across it. It mm. makes sense, and you're kind of like, what is that about? Then you see mm. it again, you're like, oh, this is obviously some kind of phrase within this society. Mm. Then you get the explanation of what the others are, and you connect it, obviously, back to the opening chapter where you, you kind of met them, but you didn't know that that was what they were. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The same thing? Or Sanderson that- is the king of that. Sanderson is the king of, like, getting phrases stuck in my brain. Like, yeah. I would I would be shocked at something, and I would mumble, like, blood of my ancestors, and my wife would look like, what the hell? Like, that's just... <laughs> It just really gets stuck where I storm you. (laughs) Yeah, I I guess it just comes to a place of reassuring the audience that their instinct that it's out of place is correct rather than they think they've read a mistake or something that's weird. Uh, Like this writer can't write because that stood out to me. Mm. It's fantasy is fun for this because sometimes we're writing magic systems where we have to set up the law and we're like this is normal this is status quo magic system Mm -hmm. but plot happening over here is the out of place magic system and that can be really tricky to find that balance because you need to get them all on Mm -hmm. board with status quo normal magic and then oh but the magic system's now acting a little bit odd over here because plot is in this direction characters are going to discover something so it's just you really have to hold an audience's hand between normal magic nonsense and then uh this is oh that's correct you've correctly identified when the the world building is broken because Mm. that the plots in that direction the, the the magic source of whoever is in that direction um which is a little different to it's funny we mentioned save the cat uh, earlier because I believe he has a saying that's kind of like you only get one kind of hocus pocus I for- I gotta forget what he actually calls it do you remember yeah, yeah, I got it it's the mumbo jumbo it's the mumbo double, jumbo double you mumbo only get jumbo mumbo rule. jumbo it's this I it's but his example sucked his he, example yeah. sucked the, <laughs> the example he gave is like writer, Spider-Man so. is not a good movie because how come one guy gets superpower from radioactive spider and another guy gets superpower from the Green Goblin, whatever happens to him. I'm like, of course that makes I, sense. I agree. This rule doesn't this apply to fantasy. Um, essentially, what the rule is meant to say is you only kind of get one buyout. You get one suspension of disbelief. The The audience is willing to be like, oh, that's one crazy rule. Yeah. I will accept this and go on. But if you make it, oh, there's now two crazy rules happening in this world, the reader goes, oh, no, I've, you've lost me. I'm out. Um, it's, and, and, it's basically... And, you're allowed one ass pull per story, <laughs> basically. One and even that ass pull better be good. Like, you, you can only pull something out of here. Sorry for profanity. Do we have this tagged for profanity? Well, we I, t- I tag every uh, episode for explicit we, just in case. We, it's, it's fine. It's fine. The audience knows allowed, what they're getting by this point. You know how there's... Basically, I, I gotta say this, you know, because we're talking magic systems. I think number one culprit of breaking a story in our genre is a magic system that's half baked and uh, the writer just needs you know he needs the magic system to do something for the plot because now the hero has to win or the villain has to win it's kind of like this anime trope where oh your ability is invincible but i have the one ability that can defeat your invincible ability yeah. and the thing that i've been like kind I of think... in my brain to oh i'll get you finish sorry no, but but that's basically it you know because I'll be honest, when I start writing a project that has a magic system, I usually don't have the magic system figured out before I start writing. Ballsy. And I kind of mm-hmm. hope I'll, f- <laughs> yeah, I kind of <laughs> figure it out as I go because I know I'm going to twist it according to my uh, to my needs. Mm. Um, but that does mean that I have a lot of my work cut out for me on draft two because I do have to go mm-hmm. back and and, you know, and iron that out. But that's just my two cents. Magic systems are risky. I want to have an episode. I I, I want to host an episode on magic systems alone. And honestly, I'd love to have an episode where we just talk about fight scenes. 
and <laughs> why yeah. why is one person allowed to win and why is one person not allowed to win and why is it interesting and why is it significant and why does it work for one's per one person's punch to be stronger than the other person's punch because again as an author you can put anything you can have the other person win you could write that down on the paper it doesn't matter but why why is one why is one person's punch stronger and that's so interesting from a plot point of view for me um James, I know you're about to say something, but I, I want to move us along a little bit. So one thing we've been talking about here is things coming out of nowhere. You're only allowed one ass pull, things like this. And um, one thing you could talk about is uh, I've recently watched something. It was analysis of Avatar The Last Airbender, and the person talks about a story tool called coincidence. You could call it a lot of different things. and um, But it's basically like, you know, when something happens and you're like, oh, well, that's convenient, like uh, making that interesting or why is that significant to the plot? Does it further the plot? Does it bail someone out of a situation? Does it add to the significance of the situation? Or does it like in a magic system scenario, does it completely break all of the significant and the emotional connection that you've tied to the rest of the magic system that you've like, whoa, this is so cool. This is how it works. I understand it. And then suddenly an element's brought in that just erases all of that. And it's like, oh, well, okay. Suddenly it means nothing. And so you're allowed to bring things in out of left field. And like, you know, that whole mumbo jumbo thing, you're allowed to have a bunch of different events. But like coming back to the example of like, you walk into the house and you have to tell your mom about your day. Usually when you want to say something crazy happened in your life, it's because like one event happened one coincidence took place that created a story around it. And then now you need to tell the story of that coincidence that took place. So if you're going to bring the reader's attention to multiple coincidences, you need to be able to tie them together in a way that makes sense. Otherwise, they feel like a bunch of different stories that are kind of running in together kind of oddly, and they kind of pull significance from the others. Um so you can do anything. It's the skill comes from can you make it interesting and can you make it significant and can you communicate your significance to your reader? Because clearly it meant something to you and you had some significance there. And yeah, can you? I do love that. I, I once had it phrased to me that the audience loves coincidences that get characters into trouble, uh, but hate coincidences mm. that get characters out of trouble. We, mm -hmm. we won't swallow that, but we love the first one. Yeah. Yep. Like if the character walks through the doorway and, and there's the detective right there that they're trying to avoid and they're they just love it. Yeah. Yep. Or the the father of the of the girl you just cheated on just happens to be your parole officer. That's great. Oh. Mm -hmm. Ooh. We haven't um what? That's just a good. I'm not talking from a body pull. It's like, oh, nice story. <laughs> I'm willing. I'm willing to cut this little part out, but I, I wanted to move things on to like language and prose and the way things are written. But James, did you want to get your point off first? Oh yeah. No, not really. I didn't really have an example. It's just um, when a story introduces rules and then breaks its rules. But I'm I'm racking my brain trying to think of a good example because I know I've had some recently because I've been thinking about that specific thing. I can't remember what set it off, but you know when like, mm. like if a magic system is set up and then, oh now this character is more powerful for for random reasons mm -hmm. or like this is how the zombie plague is transmitted and now suddenly it it works in a different way or so. I, uh, I I want to say I want to say Harry Potter like gets really close to it. Oh, wow. Okay. With the twin wands thing, it's it's like it is justified, but it's kind of late in the story to pull that out like yeah. first he couldn't touch him because of the magic and now because of the wands he can't beat mm. him does that make sense that yeah. was that was close for me personally that was like oh there's another reason he can't kill him beyond the first one yeah this is a whole conversation of its <laughs> but what were you i want to yeah. jump into it what were you going to say patty one About thing we have and yeah, we, we haven't talked about how pros can also, I mean, everything, I don't know about everything, but a lot of things we're talking about here are when the reader no longer is willing to suspend all their disbelief and just be 100% with the story, you know, for whatever reason. And something that can do that mm. uh, is pros. I don't, I'm sure we've mentioned this on the podcast before, but people say pros sometimes that 
I mean, you can always break this rule, but it shouldn't draw attention to itself. It should be telling the story and the reader should just be there digesting the words, not aware that they're digesting the words and just let the story happen. But as soon as they see something that we call it when we're in our editing process, bumping, as soon as the part of the language mm -hmm. bumps, then it's like, oh yeah, I'm reading words on a page. Like I'm actually in my bedroom, in my underwear. I'm not really reading a book. And that can be, for example, oh, yes. when a word happens in a sentence and then in the next sentence, the very same word occurs. Mm -hmm. Not something like the mm -hmm. or and, but like predicate or unbelievable or something like that. And so you're like, oh, I just saw that word a second time. That that feels wrong. That feels languagey. Mm -hmm. And that's that's big. <laughs> you mm -hmm. want the language it's to be true. subtle and camouflaged and just let also language that's too flowery and too descriptive. I mean, I'm guilty of that oh, sometimes. Yes. You're just like, I'm I'm just reading uh I'm I'm reading flowery poetry. This isn't mm -hmm. just telling a story. Yeah. And if you guys have any other examples of language. Breaking immersion like, always kills me. Oh, you go ahead, Matt. Uh, always kills me when someone gets hurt in a book and they're describing exactly which bone it is that probably is cracked. Oh, like the fifth <laughs> disc in my vertebra. Why do you know that? Do you have an X ray in your? What What's happening here? Shit like a that. doctor wouldn't be able to tell you. Oh, that was the fourth left side of my sixth. I don't know. You don't know mm -hmm. that, man. Anyway, kills my immersion, James. It's almost the opposite of what Patty said in that if it's if it's too flowery, that can happen. But also if it's just bad, it can do the same thing. Um, I was pulled out of, I couldn't finish the Expanse series. Yeah, um, you mentioned. Really, really, like, really good content, if you know what I mean. Beautiful imagery, really, really clever, really sensible stuff. But the prose, like the words on the page were just so bland and boring that I couldn't get through it. Mm -hmm. I got maybe through the first quarter of the first book. And I came across the phrase vomit zombie, which just referred to... yeah. What, 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 what? People, what was that? people, people vomit zombie, which was <laughs> vomit like, zombie? fun to say. Vomit it sounds like a death metal am... band. Yeah. Now you yes. have my attention. No. Well, what, what vomit zombie. That people had been reanimated. Dead bodies had been reanimated. They were causing chaos on this uh, space station they were spreading the disease by i guess vomiting onto other people and, and giving them the disease and i'm on board with all of that except the writing was then the vomit <laughs> came around the corner and xyz blah 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 one of the vomit zombies grabbed blah 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 and i was like oh, why did you not just come up with a different phrase <laughs> because it's painful to try to <laughs> absolute agony and it's the like whole... the, they I felt that way up until that point and that was just a point where I was like I can't deal with vomit zombies the fact that you call them zombies is bad enough the fact that you're describing them based on the adjective of what they're predominantly doing <laughs> it's, it's funny because you're you're yeah. such a patient kind man and they yes. cracked you you know exactly. they pushed you too far yeah it's like watching 28 days later and them being like the running zombies are coming or, or like something else <laughs> killing me i can't stand this so i had to tap out which is a shame because they were really um, really interesting it was a really interesting i would experience. just badly written i would love that the running so zombies if they, just, uh, if they just appended running under like look out it's like why the running zombies the running zombies. you could just say zombies <laughs> just, yeah it's like the running zombies i know the blood disease zombies are coming <laughs> why are we doing this <laughs> really frustrating oh no the light vampires are coming oh the vampires i can come out in the day okay i get it all right <laughs> what yeah, a cooler okay. phrase wow. that's pretty gross the night vampires yeah. that is such a waste of word space um full moon wolf coming <laughs> <That's the full laughs> <main wolf. laughs> you know what i just want like you know these tiktok shorts i just want shorts of james just mentioning all the possible iterations of like running zombies full moon werewolves i'll, I'll watch the shit out of that just keep going. Yeah, yeah that's good. Uh, Get Phoenix. Uh, yeah, there you go. Sorry, yes. I was, I was going to ask, uh, did we have any time left for you to, for us to mention other uh, stories that had broken the world for us? Or are we wrapping up? Can I yeah, mention one more language thing? Are... Can I mention one more language thing? Okay, yes. Yeah, so we are coming near the end here. So we we'll are. do one more language thing. We'll do story with Ali and then, uh, and then we'll get to our quote. So ambiguous descriptions or ambiguous prose 
I don't know if I've, you guys ever read uh, Life of Pi. Really, really interesting book. Oh, There's a yes. whole bunch of, I don't know if you remember this, they're on the lifeboat and the guy's trying to describe these complex sequences that where the minutiae of what happens in each moment, the actions each character is taking is really important to the scene. And there were so many times where I was reading that and I had no idea what he was talking about. I didn't understand where each mm. character was in relation to anyone else. I didn't understand the physical action. And I'm turning oh, these pages yeah. thinking, I, I, I don't get it. I don't get why this is uh, significant. Mm. Ambiguous descriptions are so bad at breaking immersion. I mm. uh, I read it, and one of my students actually chose this book as a as a book report. And I think I know what you mean. Uh, I think I know what you mean about uh, just kind of letting go of the wheel, and just he kind of goes with it, and kind of expect you to to catch on a little bit. Mm. All right, Ali, what was? Yeah, it, it kind of tears it, uh, um, ties into this. I, I tried to think of three examples we haven't quite touched on for for ways stories break for us, um, and these are probably three quite subjective ones for me. Um, in with, okay, so I'm I'm coming for Patrick Rothfuss again. Um, so so I adored his first book, Name of the Wind. Um, his second book, Wise Man's Fear. Um, doesn't get held up quite as much. It's doing uh, some other things. I, I I think simply because he uh, didn't spend the same amount of decades drafting it, it came out a little bit quicker. Um, but for me, there's a few moments in Wise Man's Fear that we mentioned fan fiction before, um, where Wise mm -hmm. Man's Fear starts to feel a little bit fan fiction-y for me. And what I mean by that is it starts to feel a little bit like an author insert and suddenly I feel like I'm in the room. R-rated. And you know the section I'm talking about. Uh, but it feels yeah. like I'm in the room with the author instead of in the room with the story. And it's this mm -hmm. story. I didn't feel that. Okay, well, good. So, I know, I'll, add, I'll let my thoughts well, stand. But... Didn't you feel like it was... Uh, uh, like th one of these movies that air at three AM, and you'd watch it muted because you don't no. want your parents to know it, that you watch it. Was watching. just no, the I explicit didn't. nature that I'm having a problem with, but just the it, the wish fulfillment is what I mean by fan fiction. That I I feel like when the author is too present on the page with me, and I mm. this, so there's a veil that's been broken, and and, and this is a, a criticism that gets thrown at why a female protagonists all the time where people are like oh it's just a Mary Sue why is this character good at everything and and I think they're talking about the same uh feeling of well now the author feels like in this feels like someone wrote it because they wanted to fulfill a wish rather than this is a mm -hmm. story that exists to entertain an audience so I got a little bit of that from wise man's fear and that it felt a little wish for Philly um, and that broke it for me. Um, the my other quick rapid fire mentions was: Has anyone else read the Poppy War trilogy? Um, no, no, no. So something that does is its whole mandate is it's going to break tropes. So it's going to set up tropes like high schools, kid. Well, oh, sorry, like the the fighter high school trope, like uh, a bunch of your your whole cast, your ensemble cast of uh, kids are yeah. going to go to the school and learn how to fight. That, that kind of trope. So it sets up just lots of well-known YA tropes. And its whole thing is we're going to make, we're going to punish you for ever having enjoyed these tropes. Um, so therefore all these kids are going to have a bad time. They're all at war. They're all going to die. They're going to have the worst time ever. Uh, so so I, I can appreciate that again, intellectually what that's doing, but this is a, a three book series that sets up a lot of fun setups that are like, look, there's fun magic systems where powerful things when happen when certain three characters come together and this power is inherited so I'm like oh I'm with you I'm with you as a reader I'm like you're going to pay that off by book three right where three people are going to come together and have the same power they're going to inherit the same power in the way you set it up in book one and then because the whole mandate of this book is we're going to punish you for enjoying it uh, by book three, none of these, it's like, haha, they're almost going to mm. come together. Actually, no, all the characters are going to bail. They're all going to turn in each other. Everyone's going to be miserable forever. And so it, it, it's intentionally diverting away from these tropes. And I'm like, cool thought experiment. But did anyone have a good time? I don't think anyone had a good time. Why, why did this exist? You set it up to break it and everyone has there. Okay, so, so that's my main thing with Poppy War. I'm like, great intellectual writing, bad feels. As a reader, I got nothing out of it. 
Um, and yep. while I'm throwing famous authors under the bus, my, my third one was going to be Jay Kristoff's Nevernight trilogy. In that I love Nevernight. I love the first one. Second one, serviceable, also entertaining. This weird thing happens in the third one where it turns out the whole trilogy has been narrated by one of the characters and it's actually all the books at tomes he's been writing the whole time and it feels like you use the term ass pull again Matad it feels like mm. another ass pull you're like oh I have to now retroactively look at the other two books I enjoyed written in the hand of this character the whole time and that actually makes it worse for me I actually now don't like any of the books because of <laughs> how it did that in it reverse engineered this narration uh framework over it um so yeah that's uh three examples of Ali's complaining about books she didn't like <laughs> or how the I, story uh, was broken <laughs> <laughs> and I, I feel Ali, like I'm just gonna one. say if you be if you become a bestseller you might know these people. You know, <laughs> I know, right? To, I have to then hang out. Might meet them. them. Damn. Like, and uh, and Rathfuss is gonna come for you. Yeah, he Rathfuss, will come for anyone. So I have to good myself. If I'm that. if I'm in that book lunch too, just remember that I I had your back. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I felt you in that second one, especially because it's like, yeah, as an author, you can write whatever story you want. And then, yeah, a lot of it's like at the end, it's like, yeah, you did that thing. You wrote that story. And then, you know, it just depends on, you know, did your reader have a good time? And does that matter to you? Or did you want to tell this story? And you're, that's fair play as well. Mm. Um, I'm just going to throw it really quick. My example, and maybe I'll get to this in another Precipice Fiction episode, and I'll just leave it as Precipice Lore, and we'll see if we ever circle back to it. My example of story breaking that really irked me was Hunter x Hunter, the anime. And I'll just leave it at that. Ooh, we'll see okay. if it riles what? anyone up. Yeah. That's it? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Matan, tune in next time yeah. to press <laughs> the to pros and cons. I hate no, when um, they do it. And I yeah, but I also I also do want to do an episode just on um <laughs> fan fiction as well as fan fiction. I'm thinking fan fiction and reading things as a sacred text, well which, which I'll touch on. I think I touched on that in the previous episode, but I love that stuff. Anyway, that brings us to about an hour, maybe a little bit over an hour. I don't know. James, I think you you have a quote for us. Indeed. And I'm um, pronouncing this author's name as Leo Tzu. And I apologize if that's the incorrect pronunciation. But the quote is, A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step by Leo Tzu, I believe. And I think that our uh, relevance for that quote was, um, what's the significance of the 11th step if we forgot to mention the first 10? Mm, deep. Boom. Um, out. That... <laughs> Precipice out. Think about that one. <laughs> anyway, well, that, that will do it for us this time. Uh, thank you all for listening. Talk to you later. Goodbye. Thank you, Phoenix. Bye-bye. Um, Bye. Ciao. You're listening to Pros and Cons, the Precipice Fiction Podcast.